Well, uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special thinking uh, on the future of the armed forces entitled, Is Britain Quietly Retiring Its Army? Uh, which will uh, give us the chance to talk about all sorts of geostrategic and uh, more localized military issues uh, uh, in the course of the debate. I I'm Matt Dancona, and I'm an editor and partner here at Tortoise Media, and I'm thrilled that you're able to join us this evening for such an important discussion. And it's actually a subject I've been wanting to, um, to think and talk about for, for a while. Um, and it's a great opportunity. We have some fantastic speakers. Uh, in the chat, um, my colleague Ellen Halliday is at the helm. Um, and please do join in with your ideas and your contributions and thoughts. The, the whole purpose of the tortoise thinking is to generate uh, journalistic ideas and inspiration. So. Uh, the more you can chip in, the happier we will be. Um, we're also joined by three stellar guests. Um, Simon Aikham, who's author of a uh, really, really quite recent book, The Changing of the Guard, the British Army since 9-11. Um, he served in the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, and it's a uh, really extensive and um, I think I've heard it described as this essential reading, uh, which I wouldn't disagree with at all. On, on where we are now with, with the, the state of the, the army. Um, it's one of those books that, that, that kind of um, is a true intervention in the debate. Uh, Deborah Haynes, who I think is, is going to join us shortly. Um, uh, there she is, hi Deborah, um, welcome. Hugely respected foreign affairs editor at Sky News and also uh, hosts the podcast, The Grey Zone, which is a very, very interesting and I recommend it to you, uh, exploration of a changing world of geostrategy and security, which uh, is is kind of essential listening. Uh, and also uh, we're joined by um, Sir Michael Fallon, who uh, was Defence Secretary from 2014 to 17. And I remember well uh, from that period was amongst much else, closely involved with the on the ground destruction of the Caliphate and ISIS. and involved in some of the really fascinating operational decisions as, as well as many other things. So he, he brings he brings to the table some, some absolutely fascinating experience, which I'm sure we'll hear more of later on. Um, why, why are we looking at this question at all? Well, because I think there's a, there's a slightly ambiguous picture. Uh, November 2020, the Prime Minister announced an additional 16.4 billion pounds over the next four years to um, protect and develop the military. Um, yet there is, an, there is a growing argument, uh, which may or may not be fair, that the purpose of the army is less clear than it was, um, that we've been through a period of, of wars that have been less successful uh, than their predecessors, and also that we're living in an age that, if not necessarily isolationist, is certainly hostile to intervention and entanglement of any duration. Um, the Biden presidency, of course, may tweak that, and it's certainly more multilateralist than its predecessor. So I'm sure that too will form part of our discussion. So I'd really like to um, dive in straight away and ask you, Simon, you know, it, it, tell us about how the book came to be and also how you, you know, you describe an institution that to a great extent is reflexively resistant to change. So I can give a bit of context on the book project and then dive into some of those points. And Matthew, it's great to be here. And thank you so much for having me. So the book is called The Changing of the Guard. And it's the story of what Iraq and Afghanistan did to the British Army. But it's also about what that means for us as a country. So my real intention with this from the beginning was to write a book that's about Britain as much as it is about the military. So I spent a year in the army when I was 18 on a program called a Gap Year Commission. And I subsequently became a journalist. So my military experiences in 2003, 2004 were limited. I did not go on operations. However, they did mean that I spoke the army's language, the mixture of slang, acronyms, specialist terms, that outsiders find baffling. And I went back a decade later to find out what had changed. So at that point, I hoped that I had the right combination of distance and closeness. And in 2014, right at the end of British operations in Afghanistan, I went there on assignment for The Economist. And some of the changes that I saw were superficial. So the camouflage was a different pattern. There were fleets of new vehicles. Everyone looked a lot younger. But at the same time, I realized there had been this enormous shift. And the central paradox that my book explores is that over the past 20 years since 
the army became a great deal more professional, less fissured by social class, less racist, and more embracing of technology, women, and minorities. Yet arguably, it also lost two wars back to back and made significant efforts to suppress a proper discussion of what really went on. And the kind of key point here about Iraq, I think, is that Britain initially preached to the US about its apparent expertise in counterinsurgency gained from Malaya, Kenya, above all Northern Ireland. And then five years later, in the spring of 2008, the US had to come and rescue British forces after the UK made a deal with Shia militias to secure the army's exit. And in Afghanistan, a similar situation occurred. So the US had to bail Britain out. And I would suggest that the issue that we face, and part of the reason that we have this contretemps now, is that there has not been an acceptance, really, of what happened in those conflicts for some of the reasons I explore in the book. And that because we have not had a proper discussion and proper accountability, it's more likely that we will repeat these situations. And it's very difficult for us to have the kind of open, frank, and, and sensible and grown up discussion about what our army is for. It's, it's interesting you, you talk about the, the need for an argument. We've had since 2017, you know, the National Security Capability Review and uh, Modernizing Defense Program, um, there's the integrated review that's underway at the moment. Um, do I take it from what you're saying, Simon, that these, to your mind, these are, these are not uh, penetrating the, the, the problem deeply enough or, or soaring high enough, perhaps, in, in terms of the concepts they deal with? I think a really helpful idea to look at is this idea of institutional preservation. And I think if you look at what happened over the past 20 years, a lot of what happened can be explained by this idea that the leadership of the military for completely understandable reasons, were doing what they thought was best for the army as an institution and for its long-term viability and stability. Um, there's this fundamental issue that is faced by standing armies that they are expensive. And if they do not have things to do, they will be cut. There are always other pressing priorities. And if you look at how these events panned out, so certainly the decisions to engage were political, but the army lobbied for engagement at divisional scale in Iraq in 2003. It's clearly an idea that the Helmand campaign could make good what had happened in Afghanistan. And that is often bandied as a strong criticism, you know, that this idea of use it or lose it. I actually think it's not very surprising. It's, it's very natural. And it is, you know, understandable that armies lobby for things to do. And I don't think they should be blamed for it, but I think it should be accepted as a factor. And I think there's often this tendency in these activities that you know, it's, it's, a, it's a resource war, right? A defense review. That's what it is. It's about, you know, what the army versus the navy versus the RAF for a often shrinking pile of resources. And part of the reason that these decisions are so difficult is that armies have to plan against the hypothetical. You know, there, there are very other few human institutions that have to do that, they have to make a case and plan for what they do without no, really knowing what that is going to be. And that puts them through absolutely no fault of their own in a very difficult position. But I fear, and I think this is partly because we have a lot of difficulty having a, a real honest wash up conversation about this kind of thing, that it will be being perceived by, you know, as who gets what. And, and that is really understandable that it happens like that. But I think if we could try and shift the debate a bit to have a more open discussion about what we want to do and what we hope to achieve, it would be better. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I suppose, but before moving on, I, I, it's, it's a horribly broad question, Simon, but I, I, yeah, we have, for, I think, around 480,000 soldiers in the army. Perhaps I'm those figures slightly out of date. Um, you know, what, what, what are, if, you, if you're answering a question to the taxpayer, to the, the voter, who will have more than likely very, very strong feelings of affection yeah. uh, to the, the armed services in general and to the history of the armed services and perhaps even local regimental uh, affections and affiliations, but what's the answer to the question? What are they for? What 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 do we say in 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 2021? Um, what's what do we say is their is their purpose? I think that there is a lot of this is about the relationship between the past and the future, right? And I think that the problem that armies find themselves in that situation is that that negotiation is in some ways a zero sum. So the military makes, for understandable reasons, it's very proud of its history and it, it institutionally deifies elements of this, but. The more you do that, the more difficult it can be to, to change and to, um, to adapt sensibly to what, what we want to do. And I think there is a very, you know, it's a really open question, what, what are they for? But I suppose my point is that because we erect these um, ideas of, it is almost sacrilegious to, to question some of this stuff, they're shibboleths. 
but we, we can't have that conversation. And the other point that comes in here, I think, is technological and that we sit at a stage where the fundamental way that conflict on land may be waged can change totally substantially. So this idea of, of mechanization and the way that traditionally the army would claim its differentiation from the other two services, where they would say that the Air Force and the Navy manned equipment and the army equipped men. And if we are moving to a situation where there are large amounts of autonomous or unmanned capability, that is a fundamental shift in the kind of DNA of the institution. You know, this idea that it is about Tommy Atkins and all of that, that there is actually a possibility that that may change in a way it's never changed before. Thank you. Well, we'll, we'll definitely come back to you, Simon. Uh, I wanted to move to um, uh, to, to Deborah. Um, welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, you, 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 in addition to your sort of um, diary news item analysis duties, have been un un undertaking this fascinating deep dive into, you know, the grey zone and and and. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, it, it, because it seems to me that, that in exploring this subject, the, the grey zone is a very good way of capturing some of, some of the pathologies and problems of the whole question. Yeah, hi, good evening. Can, can I just first of all say I feel very, um, not very substantial given the lack of books behind me. Uh, so <laughs> <for that. laughs> I'm a massive book envy with all your great massive uh, bookcases. Um, but yeah, don't judge me on my lack of books, okay? No judgment, no judgment. <laughs> uh, no, thank you so much for um, for having me. Oh, can I just, as well, I'm, re I'm on my own at the moment and I've got three kids just out there. Understood. They're eating McDonald's and watching television, but they could come in at any moment. So just to kind of set the scene. Um, yes, so I just, I just, can I just sort of come back on a couple of the, th the conversation you just had please, with Simon? Please, please. Simon's incredible um, book. Um, yeah, you, I think, did you say you thought that the arm, we had an army of 480,000? I, I misspoke, I meant, I meant 80,000, sorry. Yeah, no, I was gonna say, cause I mean, that's kind of, again, that, mis that, that sort of people might think that we have got a huge military. I mean, the entire armed forces is only about 140,000. Yes. And I think kind of therein like lies that part of the problem. It's you know, compared to decades gone by, the military is this like really relatively speaking small thing. And in terms of its purpose, it's obviously here to like defend the UK and to deter attacks. So it clearly having a credible armed forces, a credible army is like hugely important and people should, uh, the public should realize that. I think that's a that really is lost because we don't see what we conventionally think of as threat, as existential peril. We don't see it outside. So therefore you could slip into that false comfort that why, why do we need a military? What's the, what's the point? Um, and and I do think that's really dangerous territory. And I do think it's it's the you know it's the job of politicians and um, and yeah, everybody, well, the media, uh, to, to try to explain um, how the nature of the threat is changing. And that's kind of what I've been trying to do with this podcast that you kindly mentioned. Um, because, you know, it's, it is really, it's really important to look back, um, you know, in over recent history in terms of the, the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And a, a lot has, a lot of soul searching has happened in uh, in uh, externally and also to an extent internally, but I do agree that in terms of um, evidence of, of lessons learned, um, you know, there's, there's, I don't, I don't really know, you know, and and consequences of the mistakes that were made in the past. There's not really too much evidence of that, but um, I do think that when you actually want to talk about what the army is for, um, it's really important to talk about that in the context of what the threat looks like. And, um, and in that sense, and I think people in the military is, is aware, they're, they're fully aware that, you know, your, your, your tank is utterly pointless if you can only fire weapons. You need to be able to exploit data. You need to be able to um, be as technologically advanced as adversaries. And if you don't, then you will be outmatched. It doesn't, help, doesn't matter how many troops you've got. And so the re it's re I think it is really interesting. You talked about the integrated review that has long been finished, but has yet to be published. I think that's yeah. probably the truer uh, an assessment of it. Uh, it's probably going to come coming up in the next couple of weeks. But I think as well that the fact that it's been delayed so much 
again, it just speaks to, um, because the government is dealing with so many like burning crises, obviously COVID, um, it's been having to do the whole Brexit thing. And, um, and so because defense, because security, because it's not burning down the door right now, then unfortunately, while the, the really, the, you know, the, there are a lot of people who understand that the, the armed forces right now is not in the right shape to deal with the threat, and there's been an awful lot of thinking about it. There's been a lot of good papers written about um, how, how it needs to evolve and transform. Um, but because it's not an imperative for, for the politicians, then it doesn't have that, that, that sort of, you know, the political push to make that happen, which is what's really needed. And so um, I do worry that this integrated review, um, you know, will it really achieve, it, it should, it, it, it should have been a moment to really reset um, and reshape and and hope maybe it will still and um, you know there's, there, there's clearly going to be uh, cuts and re you know, a sort of a, re a realignment of priorities but I, I, the worry I have is because as Simon was saying you know it, it is that like the army um, and all three services they it's a very traditional, they've got a deep set traditions, quite conservative, reluctant to change. And the kind of change that's needed, I've thought a lot about it. It, it, it sound, this maybe sounds a bit trivial, but it, it kind of, it reminds me of how it felt to be in a newspaper, to be in a newsroom um, when the internet starts and suddenly websites are, are really important. And I can remember at the times, you know, you, you know, we would always, like the newspaper was king and getting the splash was so important. And you'd be asked to write an online article. You'd be like, oh God, not for online. This is a few years ago. But it's, it, it's that change of mindset. And it's really interesting moving to Sky now. Um, like I've been there for a couple of years. And when I joined, um, it really was a sense of like, it's, it, you know, it's, the telev it's a television channel and, um, and, and doing the website was sort of secondary. But now that's changed at the Times and at Sky and across all media platforms. They're having to wrench themselves away from those traditions of print, and move into this digital age. And that's exactly what the military is doing, um, just on a much, much bigger scale. And so it really, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it must be, so, it, it's obviously so difficult and so uncomfortable to, um, to have to leave behind, you know, that the, the ideas of, uh, of, of, you know, big of, of troop maneuvers and obviously you don't leave them behind completely but the idea of being able to launch surprise offensives it, it's got to be a thing of the past given the ability of radars and um and and drones and 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 the ability for your opponents to be able to spot you so it's a change of thinking and it's it's brought about by by technology and and it really means that the army of the future will be very very different in terms of its capabilities than the army of the past it, it, it's fascinating what you just said. It, all of it was actually, but just a particular point. The, the you know, the, the, there was an old-fashioned notion of sovereign territories that goes back to the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, and the idea that you 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 shouldn't invade a country, and when you do, um, the international community will will uh, form a coalition to stop you. And 30 years ago, that happened in Gulf War One, and it was uh, although. Um, you know, like all conflicts, it, it, it you know involved bloodshed and, and horror. It nonetheless was the, the principle behind it was understood and clear, and the British involvement was understood and clear. Um, do do you think wars like that will be fought in the future, where ter ter territories are invaded, sovereignty is um, traduced, and and you know, substantial mobilization of troops from other countries form alliances to drive back invading forces. I mean, or, or will we look back on Gulf War I as a bookend? No, I definitely think it's dangerous to, to think that all wars will be sort of in this grey zone and you don't yeah. need big troop maneuver. That's, I mean, clearly that's, like the, the gray zone is basically what happens the whole time because people countries don't want to go to war i mean it's too expensive and or, or you know the, your enemy's more powerful than you um and you just it, it's a way to kind of gain an advantage and play on the weakness and the complacencies of democracies frankly um 
but no, I, I think, I mean, well, we saw, I mean, kind of Crimea is, uh, is, is a gray zone example really, because there wasn't, there wasn't any pushback, but Eastern Ukraine is an example where there's, you know, there's been sort of forces coming in and a, and a, and a pushback and yes, okay, um, the West, well, uh, you know, Western troops have, have provide supporting role. They haven't been fighting, so so to speak. Um, but I definitely think, I mean, just I, I do think that that kind of threat is still there. It's just, there's just a whole, there's loads of layers underneath that. Like, why would you need to, why, do, why bother doing that if you can use subversion and um, to try to, Bend the will of, uh, of 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 a of a of a population to vote a certain way, or to you know, there, there's, there are there are there are other ways to use that and to use technology to enable you to have an effect on another country without having to invade. But ultimately, clearly, that's still a potential if you really wanted to. But the, I think the other thing to, the other thing to remember as well in that is that um, the weapons of today, if you ever did get to a, a real conflict involving big powers are so horrific that that also acts as a deterrent like why would you want to go to war if it would end in some horrific nuclear um like disaster thank you deb we'll, we'll certainly re return to you michael um if i might come to you um sure thank you, thank you so much for, for joining us um i mean i uh, at the risk of um a trip down memory lane i i i do want to sort of mine your memories of of, of that time, because it was, as I recall, you know, this extraordinarily um, important and, and often quite tense uh, campaign to, to uh, push back ISIS. Um, and I also remember how perhaps more than, than at any point in, in, in history, you as the responsible Secretary of State were deeply involved in operational decisions. You know, one of the things that, that seemed to me to be uh, absolutely clear was that not so much the politicization of war, but that we'd reached a point where the, the lens of public opinion was so intense upon what was going on that the person sitting in your chair had to be to a minute extent involved in almost every aspect of what was going on. Is that, is that a fair summary of what it was like? Uh, well, it was quite like that. What I can't do is compare it to, you know, the previous conflicts in the, the Gulf War that you referred to or the 2003 war, because I wasn't involved there. But I was very clear that what we were doing uh, in Iraq that time to get rid of uh, Daesh, we were doing at the request of the Iraqi government and we were doing, doing it at the request, you know, of the international community alongside our allies. So it was a war that was thoroughly grounded, you know, in uh, legality, and we were doing it therefore as a, you know, as 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 uh, as part of a coalition coming to the aid of a very fragile democracy, dealing with a death cult that, if it hadn't been dealt with, would undoubtedly have caused us more harm in the West. Now it was because of the history of the first two Gulf interventions, and it really picks up something that Debbie said, I thought it was absolutely vital having won the support of Parliament to go in and use airstrikes. And don't forget, we weren't using troops on the ground. There were no foreign troops involved in the fighting on the ground, but we were using uh, air power to help uh, the uh, Iraqi troops on the ground. I thought it was absolutely essential to maintain the support of Parliament for those operations. And I therefore took a very close interest in the targeting. I set specific rules of engagement for that conflict. I took a very close interest in the individual targeting decisions so far as I could, in, right down to the scale of the, the precision of the, um, the, the bomb or missile that was actually going to be dropped and satisfying myself that we absolutely minimize the risk of uh, civilian casualties. Because in my mind, the whole time, of course, was what was happening over in Yemen, that um, an RAF jet strafing a, a wedding party by mistake, you know, could have shattered the consensus that we had. And we had it across the house that uh, airstrikes uh, were the right thing to do, both in, in Iraq, uh, where we got agreement in 14, and then later on uh, in Syria to continue the campaign there. So I was always aware that you needed 
a certain degree of consensus behind the military. Now, this, the extent to which that existed in the first Gulf War, um, you know, I, I can't recall now. Certainly, of course, there wasn't that consensus when Blair went back in in 2003. In fact, there were divisions, you know, inside his own government about it. Do you, um, do you, do you feel that the modern convention that has certainly arisen um, since the Iraq war and perhaps before, that most significant conflicts have to be, if not legally authorized by parliament, then at least um, endorsed is, 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 is absolutely right. I mean, it's certain, it, one, one thinks back to Ed Miliband's intervention over Syria, which in turn um, gave Obama cold feet. I mean, it, my question really is one about process, which is, is, is it right that, a, that a, the modern armed services should be constrained by 650 legislators? Well, not, not in the ultimate you know, duty of a government, which is to protect its people, where you have to take action uh, extremely quickly. We always made that clear that uh, if we had to take out a particular terrorist cell that was planning an attack in, in Britain or indeed in France or elsewhere in Europe, um, where we had the ability to do so and, and nobody else did, that that was something we would have to do, you know, immediately and inform Parliament afterwards. But it, I think it was because of the history of our intervention in the Gulf and the loss of that first vote on Syria in 2030, that it really was all the more important, you know, to get the support of Parliament for this particular operation and then to maintain that support through regular briefings of, of the MPs and trying as far as we can, as far as we could, to make sure that... Um, the RAF in particular, were absolutely precise in the way that they uh, carried out their operations. So, I mean, you, you, you were obviously intimately involved as Defence Secretary in, in, in any number of internal and, and, and more, more um, cross Whitehall reviews of our national security strategy. Um, now we have the integrated review, which uh, Deborah was talking about. Um, what do you think it's priority, I mean, it's, it's we, we gather complete, but what, what are you hoping for from it as someone who has, I know, a, a deep understanding of military history as well as the future? Well, I hope it will, um, you know, I think it would, I hope it will take the opportunity actually of, uh, you know, uh, of us emerging from the pandemic and out of the European Union to reset, I think it was Debbie's word again, to, you know, reset what our place is in the world, not with any particular complacency but, um, you know, to acknowledge that we still have a huge contribution to make internationally and that our military forces are still relatively large, extremely professional compared to other economies of our size. And therefore, you know, there is an obligation on us to play our part. And I hope it will set out again, as each review has done and mine did in 2015, I hope it will summarise the threats to our country, which I believe are threats to our geo-economic security, uh, threats to uh, threats still from terrorism, threats from regional instability, whether it's in the Middle East or in Africa, and um, the need to respond when fragile democracies call on us for help. So I think, you know, those are the, you know, that is the landscape that the review has to tackle and has to show that it can do so in a more coherent way than was previously possible by you know, fusing together the military uh, in the traditional domains with the new cyber force and the space command, you know, making the changes that Simon is talking about accelerate. So the military is absolutely up to date with the changing uh, technology, uh, as, as Debbie uh, referred to it, and that the military is therefore fully fit for purpose, able to promote and protect our geoeconomic security, able to deal with terrorism where our direct national interests are affected in any part of the world, and then ready to play, to play our part in the international order where fragile democracies call on the international community for assistance that we need to be ready to do so. I mean, that is one of the purposes, I think, of having a highly trained professional uh, military that we have. Uh Thank you very much, Michael. We will certainly come back to you. Um, can I come to Peter Flynn now? Who? Um, hi, Peter. How are you? Uh, well, yeah, we're good. Thanks. I don't want to uh, 
try and paraphrase some of the interesting points you've been making in the chat. So perhaps you could um, elucidate uh, for us about yes, how you're sure. selling and the lessons you learn. Yeah, I think there were the three things that I, I highlighted and, and they were echoing some of the points that, that Simon was, was either saying at the time. First one, there's this, this delta between public sentiment, which is incredibly high for the armed forces and, and the older the population gets, I mean, it's over 90% for those over 65. So you've got this great sentiment of support for, for the army. Yet when it comes to voting, uh, and what people's prefer, you know, priorities are for voting. The armed forces it barely gets into the top ten, I think. I mean, I was just looking at Ipsos Mori for the, the, the top six: health, economy, education, asylum and immigration, taxation, benefits. So you've got this this great sentiment for the army, but then in terms of political motivation to support it, it's not as necessary because voters aren't prioritising that when when they vote. The next thing, which was echoing Simon's point, was the armies at a slight disadvantage compared to the army, uh, sorry, to the Navy and the Air Force, in that it's sort of the Navy and the Air Force have these sort of big ticket procurement items, which then justify procurement of other things and the manning of them. Whereas the army has lots of smaller but yet expensive items, you know, weapons and vehicles, which, which effectively are, are equipping the man. And so when you're holding lots of manpower, it's easier to salami slice either the manpower or the equipment when you're, when you're with the army. And you constantly saw that in defense planning rounds, you know, when I was working at the MOD. Um, and, and then the, the, the final area is this sort of training for the last war. And um, the, the really interesting, the most powerful phrase I heard a uh, commenter, you know, a friend, a colleague in, 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 who was still serving in the army, I left a few years ago, was, was we were tracking a Russian division in towards Ukraine based on their social media. And, and my, my point on that one is, um, it's, quite, it's quite a simple one, is, yeah, we may, you know, the military may have been operating on radio silence and with all the MCOM measures you like, but millennials have joined since then and they operate differently. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the three, it's been absolutely fascinating so far, but I think the army is behind the curve constantly on, on those three points. It's really interesting. Um, thank you very much, Peter. We'll uh, move on, if I may, to Maggie Harding. Maggie, are you uh, are you there? Not sure if you're okay. Um, can I come back to um, Can I come back to Deborah actually, uh, and and just return to the question of the the scope the, the scope of um, the army's responsibilities because. We're now 16 years, I think, since the UN d declared the responsibility to protect R2P. And that feels a very out of date idea now. Um, and I just, do you, can you foresee a situation where there was a humanitarian crisis of the sort that there was in the Balkans? I mean, but, you know, we got in, involved in Kosovo and so on. Again, can you, can you see a situation where we would intervene in, 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 in certain circumstances, there's a lot being made of the the new multilateralism of the Biden uh, presidency. Uh, but on the other hand, that presidency has a huge amount of, you know, uh, occupying its bandwidth. So the, the, I suppose the question I'm asking is, is that was that era of neocon Wilsonian interventionism just a brief period? Um, well, I do really, I mean, I'm sure Simon will have an opinion on this too, but I do, I think like it's, it's, it's kind of in, it's what, if you look back at Britain's you know, military history, that's exactly the sort of things, you know, British troops have always been expeditionary. Um, and, um, and, you know, we saw that uh, with the, um, the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, you know, we were the first to support the US um, to, to go in after the 9-11 attacks. And same too with the Iraq invasion. And I think that's where there was this, it was like, I think that was a really fundamental moment in terms of breaking the, the kind of, the, the, the breaking the, the framework that all of, that the military has always relied upon in the past, um, which is that trust, trust between the military and the government, trust between the government and the people, and trust between the people, the public, and their armed forces and, and their political leaders, because 
with Iraq, you had a, a war that was um, waged on, that was launched on the basis of, a, I mean, this is obviously not discussed about the Iraq war, um, but in, in terms of the, the reasons that were given for that invasion and then the conduct of the aftermath of the invasion um, and the way that we left and the legacy that was left of that really did erode trust in all those, in those three areas. And I think, and, and same too with that, with then with Af with what then happened in Afghanistan in terms of the push into into the south, and the failure there, um, and it, it, it you've lost like a huge loss of confidence. There's like there's you now. I mean, um, Michael Fallon was talking about um, how during the ISIS campaign he was overseeing what sounded like very tactical moves in terms of precision strikes. And it, it's kind of so now because the politicians are so nervous of uh, the impact of um, of military action, it means that for the, like the like commanders are kind of disempowered. Really, the tactical commands on the ground they're always having to second guess what folk back in PGHQ main building number ten are thinking. Um, and that all, it all stems back to what happened, in my opinion, what happened in Iraq, what happened in Afghanistan. And then you saw it play out in 2013 when there really was a need to intervene in a, um, against a regime that was using weapons of mass destruction against its own people um, in terms of Syria. And obviously that didn't happen. And so now you're in this situation where um, even the deployment of a small number of of personnel to, to Mali, which has happened recently, um, there's just not the, the the political will isn't there because they see the the risk and the cost and they worry about the consequ yeah, the the effect like what is the effect of all that investment is it going to actually achieve a, a, an effect that's worthwhile and it's a really it's it's so it's it's really difficult I mean I want you kind of like obviously you'd like to hope that if there was another horrific situation, humanitarian um, disaster in waiting about to be inflicted upon a population that the UK working with allies, I wouldn't, I couldn't imagine the UK doing it on their own really. And the, the, the alliance is so important, like the NATO alliance is fundamental. Um, you, you, you like to hope that, that they would do the right thing, but um, I do think that, that there's been this, the, the need there needs to be some kind of correction there because the trust, you know, the trust has got there's a lot, of, a lot of trust was lost and a lot of faith in the utility of force was lost, which and unjustly, like, oh, you know, clearly there can be, it is possible to achieve successful military intervention. Um, and, um, but people, the public maybe don't, don't believe that at the moment. And also, I mean, NATO was, as we've, we've learned, more and more since the Trump presidency ended, um, you know, there, there was a very real, clear and present danger that America might have withdrawn from NATO under Trump. Yeah, I, I was actually in. Um, I was in. Uh, I was at NATO headquarters. It was. It was his one of his second. I think it was his second. It was twenty seventeen, maybe or twenty eighteen um, when he was there. And there was it because like, I don't know if any of you have ever been to these NATO like. Michael Fallon would have done. Like the NATO meetings are so boring normally. Like the NATO, sorry, not boring, obviously very important, but the actual, the summit, they're, they're so chore choreographed. You can like write what's gonna happen like weeks ahead and everything's kind of really clear, carefully stage managed. And then suddenly this hurricane of Trump came in and just everything was unpredictable and, uh, and really quite unnerving for everybody. And he really did go into this meeting and nobody knew what was going to happen. And there really was that threat of yeah, I'm just going to walk away, and that would obviously be catastrophic for the alliance. But but funnily enough, it did that did really ignite a flame. I think um, it, within Europe of understanding that you know we really need to be able to like look out for ourselves and not not do what has been done over over decades in terms of just reliance on this huge American military presence and kind of piggybacking on, on that, which so. President Trump was definitely right to call them out on that because you, know, you, you sort of look at the UK armed forces and criticize them, but just look at the, the majority of the rest of the European members of NATO and their armed forces aren't in anywhere near as good a, a condition as ours. Like I would say that, but it's a bit patriotic, but there you go. No, no, of course. Um, thank you, Deborah. Uh, um, Simon, can, can I come to you? There's, there's at least uh, two people have asked 
what the res- what the response in the uh, military has been to your book. And um, well, I'd, I'd rather you tell the story. Yeah, sure. It's been it's been very polarized. And I mean, before it was published, there were substantial efforts to kill it, which I was able to to circumnavigate. So it has now been published. I think in broadly, it is generational. So a huge feature of the Iraq and Afghan wars was this generational divide that arose between people who were out fighting these conflicts and people higher up. And that, in the early stages within the officer corps, was often between captains and lieutenants and those above them. But that generational divide moved up the uh, institution as the conflicts went on. And I would say, roughly, the, the, the division between people who've really embraced the book very positively and where it gets different is at this stage within the army, probably between colonel and brigadier, so between people in their in their mid forties, I would say. But there are fascinating exceptions to this. So I think that there, you know, I've had a number of people who are much more senior than that. I've had not, you know letters from from two star generals saying they liked it. I think the, the the initial pushback against it was on kind of two fronts. The first was, well, you only spend a year in the army. What do you know? Which I think is very understandable. But actually, when um, people have seen the book and, and in some ways the level it's been reported that has has gone uh, to some extent the second narrative which which certainly came up in some of the review coverage was it was all the, the politicians fault and um i think you know fascinating that seemed whether that was coordinated i don't know and i think you know the book doesn't suggest that there was not political culpability for what happened but it suggests that there was essentially there was a decoupling between uh, senior commanders career prospects and operational performance but, but it, what has been really moving since the book came together has been my mailbag. And I've had just extraordinary and often very touching letters from people, often who were Iraq or Afghan veterans, but also, you know, a guy who fought in Vietnam, a woman who'd clearly dated a lot of army officers, like that sort of thing of, of people who were really touched by this and it mattered to them. And I think, you know, this book is getting a lot of coverage and there's a lot of noise about it. Um, at the, at, interestingly, at the moment, there's not been a huge amount of engagement from kind of professional defence correspondents and things. I know they've got a, got to focus elsewhere, but I think the sense appears to be evolving now. And again, you know, the army does tend to coordinate these things, so I don't really know. But to say we don't agree with all of it, but it's a book that needs to be read, and I I would welcome that. Actually, I think you know this. In many ways, what I what I felt was that. The way we talk about the army, particularly in Britain and particularly compared to the US, is circumscribed by various restrictions that are placed upon the media in their interaction with the military, but also a culture in some ways of reflexive genuflection to the military, which which I can understand where it comes from, but I think ultimately is unhelpful. And that we need to have frank and open discussions about it. And if if my book achieves that goal, then I feel it will have achieved its objective. Is it just a numbers game, Michael? I mean. You clearly, and this is a this is a question that automation and AI are posing to you know organisations, non-military and otherwise, um, which is what what it's not not just a question of how many you've got, but what they do, and I I imagine that that makes not just the question of recruitment harder, but the question of upskilling and reskilling people you already have you know in the army. And I just wondered how you saw that particular um, challenge. Well, I think it's a particular challenge for the army compared to the other two services, because the army depends in the end, you know, on, has depended in the end on, if I can put it like this, muscle and, and marching. To the extent the other, the other services don't, they increasingly now depend, you know, on skills and, uh, uh, and brain power. And I think the army now has to continue, you know, to change very rapidly to embrace uh, the way in which these modern threats are crouched uh, uh, and involve systems and screens and skill sets that the army regiments traditionally have not uh, recruited from. So that, I think, is going to be a driver of change. And uh, I hope it'll be beneficial, actually. That we'll get away from simply counting numbers and having the media say, you could put the whole of the army inside uh, Wembley Stadium, or Stadium whatever yeah. that tells you or not, and, and actually w- work out just you know what level of proficiency we have in countering these very real threats now, whether they're from terrorists, whether they're from hostile states or operations in the grey zone, 
whether it's cybersecurity or whatever, whether we have the capabilities uh, to deal with that. And I suspect that's going to mean faster change in the army than in the other two services. And is it the case, I mean, there's, there, there's a sort of, um, it's almost a meme now that, that the, uh, the modern armed forces need to be, you know, uh, incredibly uh, digitally proficient. Um, the, the, the future is drones. The, the major enemy is cyber warfare, it's cyber, cyber, cyber attack. And all the, with, with a kind of heavy insinuation that coding is more important than square bashing. And I just wonder whether you think there's a risk of overcorrection. Oh, well, there may be. You know, if you're going to recruit the right kind of brains for, um, you know, for 77 Brigade, for example, to deal with cybersecurity, do they have to be fit? Do they have to run so many kilometers before, before breakfast with a heavy, heavy pack? Are you missing out on a pool of potential recruitment because you're simply insisting on some of the old style uh, standards of fitness and of muscularity? Um, but equally, there's always part of me that uh, says, you know, every time you think you're never going to use part of your military again, and it's completely redundant, you know, you're proved wrong. The Russians sent uh, heavy armor into the Donbass. They sent tanks into the Donbass and used it very successfully. Then in turn, we saw drones dealing with tanks in the conflict in Armenia. We saw an aircraft, the American aircraft carrier in the Gulf, increasingly being used to take out terrorists an aircraft carrier fighting terrorists. That wasn't in the original prospectus for building an aircraft carrier uh, back 10 or 15 years ago. So I, you know, I hope we don't uh, throw all our capabilities, uh, our traditional capabilities out in this integrated review, but clearly we've got to keep adapting the army to this uh, new world where the technology and the domains in which it's used have changed quite dramatically just in the last four or five years, and certainly since the 2015 review. And Michael, the, 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 there's, there's a, a lot of debate still about, you know, the, the, the role of low intensity conflicts and the, 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 the battle for hearts and minds. And because of the British Army's um, experience in Northern Ireland and Malaya and elsewhere, there's, there's, there's an argument that this is something which um, we can or at least should be able to do. Do you, do you see that? Uh, that that less intense military role as being one that will become more or less important in the years to come? Well, I think it'll be more important. It is one of our proficiencies. It's something we're good at. It's part of our effort still in Afghanistan, which is to train up the Afghan uh, forces in counterinsurgency. You know, it's something we've learned the hard way in successive campaigns since the Second World War. And I think it's a strength that the Americans uh, recognize that we do have to offer other forces. But I, you know, I suspect, again, this is going to be, you know, as part of, of international, an international coalition, or it's simply going to involve the, uh, the homegrown forces on the ground to help them tackle their insurgency better. Uh, if you take Nigeria, for, as an example, you know, clearly our role, if we want to help more, ought to be to help train up their military to better tackle the insurgency in the north of that uh, country, rather than start deploying British troops to do so. And that's, you know, one of the worries I have about our intervention in Mali, for example. Yes, it's interesting. Um, there, was, there was a point in the, in the uh, chat uh, by Abby Mallet about, you know, the, whether there's a danger of de uh, deployment to Mali experiencing mission creep. Do you, do you think that's a fair uh, concern? I think that's already happening. It's not wholly clear to me, you know, exactly how that mission is being defined, uh, the extent to which you're keeping peace or trying to uh, make peace. And I think our troops, uh, you know, could end up in quite a difficult position there unless we're very clear about how far they are prepared to uh, use force beyond simply protecting themselves. Um, but, but you know, that's um, something, you know, that we're, we are relatively better equipped to deal with because of our experience of counterinsurgency. And it's something, you know, we can, we can lend the rest of the world. Thank you, Michael. Uh, can I come to my colleague, uh, Nemo Omer, please? Um, Nemo, hi. Hi, you? I'm good. Um, you, 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 made, you made a, a, a very simple, but very, very important point in the, in the chat. 
um, which I'd love you to explore for us. Um, yeah, sure. So I think I just said that, like, I was just responding to something Ellen had said that um, that she would be like quite concerned and worried if she saw the military on the street. And I, I was like, yeah, I think I'd be terrified. But I, I think that I'm coming from a fairly unique position in that, um, like, my family like fled war, and so I don't think that I am particularly like I don't, I don't, and I, I don't have this feeling of patriotism or um or or particular affinity to the military and i think some people mentioned in the chat that young people gen generally i think maybe feel that like seeing as we like i i did not see wars and in, in terms of the country going to war and everyone like talking about war as a thing that we need to do in terms of protecting democracy or anything like that war was has always been talked about and intervention has always been talked about as something that we shouldn't do and I think that generally speaking, I feel very hesitant and critical, and that's always been my position in terms of military interventions of the army. And I have always, and I just think that the imagery of the army and the idea of the army being on the streets really scares me because of the my my own life and the things that my family have seen and the things that I've come the, the, the place that I come from. But also just like generally, I think a lot of young people, I think a lot, a lot of people of color, I think a lot of refugees, a lot of people who come from areas that are on the receiving end of war, perhaps because I think for a very long time, Britain hasn't really experienced that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's something very visceral so to it's, me. It's, I, it's, yeah, it's I such an interesting point, Nimmo, because it's, um, you know, uh, what you're what you're suggesting, which I, I suspect has, has a lot in it, is is this a generational shift away from the idea that, um, you know, a career in the armed services was a was a a logical thing to do and I, I is that something you've detected in you know amongst friends you know people fellow students and so on that that actually it's not seen in that way anymore not at all I mean maybe it's just my group of friends and the people I run in circles with but um I, I think that we actually were in school anyway like collectively horrified when the army would come in like people if people would come in and say you should join the army you know this is a viable career option and we would all be like why are you coming into our school and suggesting that this is a legitimate thing to for, for, to recruit young 16 year olds and 17 year olds into doing and um and then you get into university and you become very obnoxious and annoying about this kind of thing and um that definitely happened to me as well and I think I'm still there probably in terms of like it is a very much it, it is not seen as a I think many of my friends and a lot of people I know see it as a thing that we don't it is not something that, that you should be doing you shouldn't be going into the army you should not be a part of the military like I don't I, know I, it's just something that a lot of people around me think at the moment no, it's very it's very interesting thank, thank you Nimo um can I come to Andrew Good Goodwood please Oh, yeah. Hey, Andrew, how are you? Good. Good to see you. Um, you made a point about um, one particular way in which the army has been deployed recently, which I think may have some um, broader relevance. Um, the, the vaccine rollout. For COVID. Yes. Yes. I, I was I listened to the Nemo and empathizing, but then I thought, wait a minute. I was very relieved when the, the the army was at least available to get, you know, medicine across the country. And that made me think, well, actually, the army is, you know, expert at logistics. It's got the boots on the ground. It's got, you know, the, 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 the um, standby uh, capability. It, it, and it just seemed to have the ingredients to reassure me that if we need to get medicine across the United Kingdom, or in fact, uh, over the borders, we could. So, you know, at the start of this conversation, we talked about what's the role of the future army to determine is the army fit for purpose. That to me feels like a plausible future purpose for having, you know, trained boots on the Engage, ground. Engaged in, I mean, you know, the, the, the two obvious examples of that are, are vaccine deployment and then the, the, the use of um, the army in the 2012 uh, London Olympics for security, which, you know, um, was not expected, but went down quite well yes and and i don't know about liverpool but the mass testing was that was that army in yes as well? there was some involved i think yeah um, and i think yes michael go ahead yeah 
Yeah, sorry, there have been other examples as well. I remember the reluctance in Cabinet to deploy troops in 2017, if you remember a time of the, uh, the Manchester Arena uh, bombing. And uh, there were some of my colleagues who wondered, you know, how the public would react when the police, if you remember, the armed police was, were overstretched and they needed backup from the military on the streets, guarding key locations and uh, guarding power stations and so on. But once the troops were actually deployed, the public reaction was uh, really quite favorable. They could see the danger from these terrorist attacks and they, they welcomed the fact the military were there. And I think we've seen that when the military has helped out with flood defenses and so on. But it does take us back to something that was said earlier, I think again by Debbie about um, the relationship between uh, the civilian population and the military. You know, have, have, has our military, you know, performed to the extent that the civilian population, like Nemo, you know, doesn't really want to hear about it, doesn't really feel part of it or that they own any part of it and simply wants to contract out that rather messy business of defending us against threats or uh, responding to international calls for assistance to help fragile democracies. Um, um, do we sufficiently bind the civilian population into that? And I know that worries people in the military, that sometimes the military are perceived as victims, you know, when there are these uh, uh, terrible casualties as there were in Afghanistan and Iraq, and people suffer life-changing uh, uh, injuries, as to whether the military end up as, as victims without proper public understanding of why they've been sent on these particular missions and public support for them. Thank you very much, Michael. Unfortunately, we've reached the end of our hour and we could go on for a very long time and I've been absolutely intrigued and I've learned a lot and um, I, I'm just going to summarize very briefly a, a few points which is that it seems to me that we are um, to borrow Deborah's uh, image we are in a gray zone um, conceptually because the, there is obviously a there is a divide which may be partly generational in public sentiment uh, uh, in our relationship with the army, which will play a huge part in, in years and decades to come in how the army is funded and the role that it plays in our society. Um, but also it, there is a, a, a genuine and, un, un, and, and in, at, at best incomplete debate about the purpose of the modern army, that there is a, a whole range of um, uh, cyber tasks, um, things that are more technologically based than muscle based, and that this will uh, pose an, an enormously complicated challenge of recruitment and training um, to, to those who are looking to, you know, fill, fill, fill the places in the next 10 years. Um, uh, and and, and I, I was fascinated by both what Simon and, and, and Deborah had to say on that, because on the one hand, there is clearly need for um, huge cultural change um, but I was struck very powerfully by what Deborah said about not forgetting that you know we can't assume that there will, there will never ever again be a situation like the invasion of Kuwait um, and that we, we, we mustn't assume that war is going to be fought exclusively um, through a, a console and, and uh, by remote control um, or by special forces uh, backed up by drones and so on, and, and, and that one must always avoid overcorrecting in, 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 in strategizing in this way. Uh, so it's a fa absolutely fascinating uh, point, I think point of, um, point of not indecision, but of, 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 ge of genuine need for debate. And one hopes that as, as the post-COVID era becomes a reality, there'll be space, there'll be bandwidth to think about this in a in, in, in a more um, extensive way. But we've made a start tonight. I'm hugely grateful to our three wonderful guests. Uh, hugely grateful to you all for joining us. Uh, do come again and have a wonderful rest of the evening.